This is a Chippendale style chair that I've just finished repairing. I'm going to show you over two episodes how I repair this chair. It came to me with a broken back rail here and this was separated in due parts and the tenons were broken off on both ends. For me to repair this chair I needed to disassemble this and to disassemble it I needed to take the upholstery off. So I'm going to start this episode by taking to a professional upholsterer and he's going to show us some tips on how to remove upholstery. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. What I need to do is take that apart, repair it, and put it back together so I can get this chair in working order. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. So Darren, how long have you been doing upholstery? Uh, Scott, I've been doing upholstery for about 35 years at a, at a high-end level of upholstery. Wow. And how did you get started? Uh, actually, I took it in, in high school and I fell in love with it and uh, I just got lucky and got a job with an apprentice for 11 years and he taught me all the trade. Oh, wow. So you've been doing this out of high school? Yep, right out of high school. Wow, fantastic. I love it. It's a, it's a great profession. Oh, good, good. So on a chair like this, where do we start to take the upholstery off? Usually what I'll do is I'll take the chair like this and I'll turn it upside down okay. in this process and I will start to take the lining off. As easy as I can, I usually take a pair of scissors. We start, we start to take the dust cover off, and it's just actually a throwaway anyway, so I don't have to take time and take the staples out right away. I just cut, me personally, I just cut all four corners, and then it's easy for me to rip off afterwards. And then I just take a pair of side cutters like this, and I just start to pull off the dust cover like so. And this is just a standard staple puller to take staples out. You can buy it from Canadian Tire, and I just go ahead along like this. I do it this way a little bit easier, but if you're not that good with a smaller tool, you can buy, you know, have a hammer or something that works good enough, and you just proceed like this, and I just continue going along until I get all the staples up a little bit out of the out of the wood, and if you want, I'll show you how to remove them after that. Then I just take basically a pair of side cutters, and I just start to pull them out like this, one at a time, and they come out nice and easy, and then that way you don't, don't destroy the, the fabric or anything that you need to afterwards sometimes a few of them get stuck so you just have to go back and maybe open it up a little bit more and you can start to take them out that way and then you start to have the fabric all off the off the chair now we're going to proceed to take off the nail heads and i prefer myself to actually bring the chair up this way because i have a little bit more control when i'm using the tools to take the take the nails out this is how we take the tack out i just basically keep tapping the tool until the tack comes out high enough And then you can use the side cutters to help you when you get them there. And here's the last nail head that I pulled out. And here's the three nail heads that we have out from the side of the chair. Well, thanks, Darren, for showing us how to take out these nail heads and the staples. I've now got an idea of how I can do this quickly in my shop. I'm going to take off the rest of the upholstery, and then we'll get to the woodworking repair. The problem I'm fixing with this chair is this broken part here. And each of the tenons on the ends are broken off. So I need to repair those as well which means I need to take this back apart so I can reassemble it again. And to take it back apart, you need to take the front apart. But this whole chair is really loose. I can see how loose the joints are. So I should be able to take this apart in just a few minutes. I'm going to leave this back together. The joints are tight up here and I don't want to push it and potentially break those. I've got enough leeway here that I can move this in and out so I can get this broken piece inside here. Before I set the back aside, I'm going to measure this tenon here so I know the size I need to add on to the end. The next part is to put this back together again. And I can tell this has been repaired before. There's a fracture in here and the best evidence is right here. So. 
I've got glue on this area here and glue on this area here and it's uh, a little bit thick and what that tells me is when the last person repaired this they would have clamped this part up here because it didn't break again this is a new piece of wood that broke but down here this glue just gave way they didn't clamp this so that's why I'm so specific when I recommend how to glue there are four things you need one is a tight joint one is a clean surface one is clamping pressure and the other is spreading enough glue across the whole joint and you can see here there wasn't enough glue across the whole joint and that obviously wasn't clamped so I have to clean out this old glue because glue doesn't stick to glue unless you're dealing with high glue and because this is a failed joint here and I'm not exactly sure I've got a perfect fit I'm going to be using epoxy to glue this joint The glue's now dried on this piece, and as you can hear, it's rock solid. So I need to put tenons on these sides before I clean everything up. And I've decided to use quarter inch dowels. It's taken a little bit of figuring out here to figure out how to do this reliably. I need to put them on a bit of an angle, so I've got a clamping structure I'm gonna set up here. Uh, the first thing I need to do though is trim off the excess tenon that's here that's broken off, so I've got a nice clean surface to work with. I'm gonna use my Japanese saw here. It's made by Gyakujo and it's got one side here where the teeth are more coarse and that's for ripping and this one's for cross cutting so i'm going to use the cross cut side and what i'm going to do is just gently clean up this edge here so there you can see does a nice job of cleaning that up. So Japanese pull saws, highly recommend them. With the end square, what I've done is I've marked where I want the center of the holes to be drilled. So I've got a corresponding line here to line them up so that I get them exactly where I want. And then the tricky part has been setting this up so that this is perfectly level and that it's square to the jig here. So this is critical to making sure that I get the holes exactly where I need them. So I've got a mark here I'm lining up to get it square. And I've got this propped up here so that I can clamp it down and not put pressure on the piece to break it. So it essentially floats in that middle. I'll line up the part. Here's the center line. So here I'm lined up on the center. I'm just going to hold this down while I drill. So now I can take it out of the clamp. And good snug fit there. That one's a little loose. Let's see how we did here. Good snug fit there. Good snug fit there. Okay, it's looking pretty good. On this side I've got one that's a little loose and one that's good and tight. So I might have to epoxy that one in just depending on how the fit is once I get it into the chair. The next step is to fit these dowels into mortises on the side here. I've set up this dowel so that the bottom one corresponds to the bottom of the mortise. So I just need to drill that out. And then the next one up here, I'll have to 
locate and drill out. Now there is a little bit of a sliver in here. It's interesting. This is another hint of a previous repair. If I put a chisel right up here, you can see there's a thin sliver of wood. So someone's previously wedged in this tenon, which is probably why it broke versus just coming out. To accurately drill out holes, I need a flat spot here. So I'm gonna use my flush cut saw. And this is another Gyokujo saw. Uh, Gyokujo is a brand name. Uh, you and I might recognize Stanley as a brand name. Gyokujo is a Japanese saw brand. So we give it a test fit here. Yeah, looking good. So the next step is put the next dowel in next to it, mark it out, drill it, and we're good to go. I'm gluing this up with liquid high glue and I'm using tight bond here. There's another one called old brown that you can use as well. And it just saves you from having to heat up the glue and make it from glue crystals. I've got a few videos on gluing if you want to see those. I'll leave you some links in the description and you can check those out. I use right now six different glues in my workshop depending on the project I'm working on. Now the reason it's important to use high glue on something like this, this is an antique and high glue is a reversible glue, which means you can heat it up and take the joint apart. So when you're working on antiques, you want to make sure that you're using the right glue and that way if there is a damaged part at some point, you're able to take the chair apart, fix it and get it back together again. So I'm just going to spread the glue in the key joints here and then clamp it all up. Now the back, what I'm doing is I'm just going to glue the back first because chairs are normally assembled back and front individually and then they're put together front to back. And I like doing it that way when I've got time just because it makes it easier to Put a chair together, get it square and level, if you've got a front and back assembly that are already completed. So this goes down in here. And then I'm just going to put a touch of glue on these pieces here. So for my piece here, what I'm going to do is Put glue on the dowels in the hole. So do this first and then put glue on them afterwards. So that's a fully loaded joint now. Do the same thing here. And we'll be good to put the chair back together again. Okay, and here we go. Start putting it together.
need one more clamp down at the bottom here. And this one's not quite closing up. I thought there'd be enough pressure on the legs, but there isn't. So I'll clamp that one on and that's nice and tight. Good and tight. And we're good to go. I'm almost ready to assemble the rest of the chair, but what I need to do is clean out the mortises and clean off the tenons. And the easiest way to clean out a mortise is with a drill bit. But the specific way I do it is I put the drill in reverse and get it to the bottom of the hole. That way I'm not going to change direction of the hole if I drive it in straight and then turn it forward. And you hear that crunching sound? That's the glue coming out. So if I dump this off to the side here, you'll see those are all the glue particles I'm clearing out. So this is a really quick way to clean out the mortises. So the other ones here are larger and I've got, what is this, a 5 8 bit. And the 5 8 bit will do the same thing. Now, I'll go in backwards, but I need to make sure I'm not putting too much pressure on because I don't want that mortise to go all the way through. So again, turn it backwards, get it in, just gently put it forward. This one's got a lot more glue in it, so backwards and then forwards. So here I'll dump it out. You can see all the glue particles. And this is high glue that's coming out of here. I can tell by the crunchiness of it. And if you add a bit of moisture there, it'll just turn sticky. So I don't actually have to get too carried away because when I put the new high glue in, it's going to reactivate that glue. So we'll be good to go. Now on the tenons here, you can see I've got some glue here that needs to come off. And on this one particularly, it has some finish on it. So I want to make sure I get that back to bare wood so I've got a good gluing surface. The easiest way I do this is I just put my thumb up against the shoulder here and then just use a file to gently take that off. Now, if you're new to this, I would recommend using sandpaper so you don't get carried away and change the size. But I've had enough experience here that I'm just taking off the slightest bit here to clean off that finish. Just like that. Now on the shoulders, sometimes you end up with finish like this, or you could end up with glue. And all I do is I take a three quarter inch chisel and lay it flat on that shoulder. And I take that far end and just bury it into the end of the tenon. And then just slowly pair around to clean off that shoulder. So what I'm doing is using the reference surface of the shoulder to help keep it level and make sure I'm not cutting away parts I shouldn't. So you can see some of that gunk coming off. It could be some old furniture polish when there's a loose joint. And what I want to do is clean up that joint so I've got a good gluing surface and there's nothing preventing that joint from seating properly where it needs to be. So we've got all the parts laid out here so this will be easy to assemble. Now normally if you're new with this what you'd want to do is label all your parts when you take them apart. It just makes for easy assembly and the last thing you want to do is scramble when you're putting together a chair because you've got limited time to get the glue on and get everything assembled. So the general rule is about 15 minutes. But uh, read, the, read the label on your glue and you'll see for sure. So what I'm doing is putting glue inside the mortises with the back of the artist brush. And then 
on the tenons, just spreading it all around like that, and then covering the shoulders as well. Just like that. And then what I do is come back and put a little bit of glue on the shoulders. Sorry, that's not the shoulder. Where the shoulder goes on that joint. Okay, so that's put together. Now move on here. I'll start with the leg. So if you recall earlier, I talked about putting the front and back together first. So that's what I'm doing here. This is the leg where the front goes. So good, generous coating of glue here. On that joint. And then come over here, do the same thing. and then we can start to put it together. So the nice thing about when you've got glue on these joints is they come together nicer than when they're dry. See a good drip here. Okay, and then back over here. So there's the front assembly. Now it's connecting the front and the back. So I'm going to lay this down. And then I can get this all glued up. Now the important thing here is putting some significant weight on the chair and that way as I clamp this up everything's level and the chair doesn't need to be adjusted afterwards. And when you clamp it up you should have glue squeeze out that's showing you you've got enough glue loaded up in that joint. It comes with practice just to learn how much glue to get in there but you always want some squeeze out. Never skimp on the glue. And then when the glue squeeze out, it's just a matter of wiping it up. And I'll come back once everything's dried 
and just give it one final wipe with warm water to clean up any residue. The glue on these joints is now dried so I can unclamp everything. And the next step is to touch up the finish where the repairs were made and get them ready so we can put the upholstery on. So this is where I did that glue up. It matched really well here, but there's a bit of a height difference here. So I need to smooth that out. But as I'm looking closer now, I can actually see there used to be a break here and that was repaired. And there used to be a break here and that was repaired. So this whole chair must have been broken at some point and someone would put it back together. Unfortunately, when they repaired this piece up here, they didn't do a very good job of aligning it. So I have to even that out and then we'll stain it. And then I need to test the finish to see what finish needs to go on top of this. And I'll show you some tricks on how to do that. Well, the best tool for the job to level that out is to use a spoke shave. You could use a chisel with it, uh, but a spoke shave will give you a much smoother profile. So it's probably going to take me down to about here. Uh, I'm going to have some bare wood to deal with. actually not that far so that's not too bad a few more passes just to even it out okay that's good now some 120 grit sandpaper and get this all smooth On the front here, I've got some epoxy that I need to clear off just to smooth that out. So I'm just going to use a chisel for that. And if I need to, I might have to sand it a bit, but I'm going to try to avoid that because it'll reduce the amount of repair I need to do. Okay, I'm not really happy with how all that is showing up there. So I'm going to sand it and down here too, because I want that to look much nicer than it is. There are a couple minor voids in spots here and here, the one down here, and there's a couple of different products I could use on this. One of them would be wax sticks, but since I have to stain this anyway, uh, I prefer to use wax sticks just where you've got a finish. Um, I'm going to patch this with uh, just a regular uh, wood patch. So I'll just work it in here, leave it a little bit proud, and then once it's dried, come back and sand it and then I can touch it up with a stain. I'm using an antique walnut stain. This is a Saman water-based stain. And this is a new technology in finishes. I was taught by a finisher how to use this. Now the nice thing about this type of stain is if I put it on here and I get it wrong, I can just take a towel and I can wipe it off. You can't do that with penetrating stains that are oil-based. So it's a really cool technology that is very helpful for patching. So what I'm going to do is layer on a coat. Just get a little bit on the brush. And you can see how that covers nicely.
Now with any stain, you can use several coats. So I'll probably have to come back and do a second coat on these pieces. And depending on the brush you're using, you can get pretty fine with where you're applying the stain. This brush is uh, a medium size that I use uh, just in general, but I can get into a few tight spots. This is the second coat, and I'm using a finer brush here. This is where finishing gets a little artistic. It's using some fine strokes in some areas, and it relies on using your eye as well to match that color and get it dialed in to disguise the repair that was here. The great thing about these water-based stains is they don't have a smell to them. They're odorless. So it's much healthier to be working with these in the workshop than with traditional stains. The other benefit of these water-based stains is cleanup is just using water. To test the finish, I choose an inconspicuous spot. This is just under the seat here, so no one will see this. And the first thing I check for is an oil finish, but I know this isn't an oil finish. There's a film on it. So the next test to test after an oil finish is for shellac. And use a little bit of denatured alcohol. Just put a drop on the surface there and see what happens to it. If it gets sticky, that means it's shellac. If it doesn't get sticky, then there's a subsequent test to go through. Let's take a look here. It doesn't seem to be sticky. Let me try that again. That's just coming off. So I'll move on to the next test and that's to test if it's lacquer. So now with some lacquer thinner, I'll put a drop on there and we'll see what happens. You can see here I've got a shinier finish and here where I put the lacquer thinner, it's dull. So what it's doing is it's taking off the finish. So this tells me I've got a lacquer finish. I sprayed on three coats of lacquer and in between sanded it with a 400 grit paper. And that's given me a result I'm happy with and I'll show you a close up of that in a minute. But first I want to thank our Patreon contributors. It can take me anywhere between 8 and 16 hours to shoot and edit a video. And that explains why there's a gap in time between when I publish videos. Now our Patreon contributors are contributing to video production and that's helping me spend more time focusing on video work. So if you'd like to help contribute to our video production work, you can follow the link that's in the video description below to Patreon and set up a contribution there. We've got different levels that give you rewards. Uh, we've got a high five level and all of our Patreon contributors here are at the high five level. We do have levels where you can get one-on-one -on -one business advice from me or one-on-one -on -one repair advice as well. So I encourage you to check that out and help support making more videos. Let's take a close look at this repair. So of these three pieces, it was the bottom one that was broken. The tenons were broken off at both ends. Now this is rock solid chair and the break across here and here is concealed. And you can just barely see a couple old breaks here. This one is a larger scar. So I'll touch that up before I'm done here. So on the back here, this piece was broken off here and here. And you can see it's a little more concealed than this previous break here. And this spot here and here. So I'm gonna to touch these up and we'll get the chair upholstered. 